Welcome to the Lansdowne Sermon for Sunday the 21st of March 2021. It was a year ago this Sunday that I recorded my first ever online sermon shortly before the start of the national lockdown. That was a 22nd of March 2020. It has been a long year. This Sunday, 21st of March 2021, God willing, will be the final Sunday that we are online only. We will continue online for those who are unable to join us in our building in West Norwood. But from next Sunday, the 28th of March, we will be open for live services at 10 for those over 70 or who are, who are in the vulnerable group and at 12 for everybody else. We will still be subject to the precautionary rules for social distancing and for masks and so on. But God willing, over time, those rules also will be lifted and we'll be able to join, as it were, in normal services where we can sing God's praise. We can sit next to each other. We can enjoy fellowship together. But for now, we will return next Sunday, one week's time, the 28th of March, the two socially distant services. You are very welcome if you are a member or regular at Lansdowne or just in the area to come at 10 if you're over 70 or 12 if you're not to join us to worship the Lord. And if you're unable to come or you live further away and are picking this up uh, using the internet, um, but don't live in our area, I will continue to record the sermons as will others who share God's word for us at Lansdowne. So you'll have, God willing, an online sermon each week also, either in video form like this one or in audio form. But right now we're going to pray that God will speak to us and then I'm going to read to you from his word. Father, we thank you that we are not bound by distance or location in receiving your word. Father, we can sit in our homes, we can be out and have this playing in our, on our phones and in our ears. We thank you, Father, that we can listen to this over and over again. Lord, this is your word and we want to benefit from it. We thank you that as your word is faithfully preached, we truly hear your voice in your word. To this end, Lord God, I pray that I would faithfully preach your word and that we who are listening, whether it's on Sunday or any other day, wherever we are, that we would indeed hear your voice and you would do us good, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The reading today is taken from the book of Psalms, Psalm 16, and we'll read the whole psalm. Psalm 16, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord, I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. 
I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Praise God for his word. Now the Psalms tell us often about taking refuge in the Lord. But how? What does that look like? How can we feel a peace and security in God when all around us is uncertain and changing? Imagine you are in a dangerous storm. You find a building, but you don't know how to get in. And it can be like that in the Christian life. We know that we should be taking refuge in the Lord. But often we don't know how. We know that he's our place of peace and protection in the storms of life. But we struggle to experience that sense of refuge. Now, the good news is that God knows us. And he has given us this psalm through David to show us what it means to find our refuge in him. David, in instructing us in how to find refuge in the Lord, starts with a prayer. Indeed, the whole psalm is a, a prayer and testimony of having the Lord himself as our refuge and all taking refuge in God is begins with prayer there are many other things in this psalm thy trust will help us but it begins with prayer when we are in trouble when we are in comfort and peace when we are well or sick when we are joyful or sorrowful whatever situation we are in we can come to God in prayer. You, If you are a Christian, you have that unique privilege of coming to God through Jesus Christ, coming to God as his child and talking to him. And David starts with this phrase, preserve me, O God, preserve me. It's interesting that that word is used elsewhere, keep me. In fact, that word is used in relation to the Garden of Eden, where God commands Adam to keep, to take care of the Garden of Eden. And that's a wonderful analogy and a wonderful picture of God taking care of his people, that he watches over us, that he nurtures us, that he waters us, that he allows a the sun to shine upon us, that he sometimes prunes us, that he has an objective of our growth. Just as you want a garden to grow, the plants to grow and flourish, the vegetables to grow so that we can eat them, the trees to bear fruit, so God works on with us, works on us, prunes us, nurtures us. He protects us from those who would come and steal the fruit. His constant eye is upon his people. And that's what we're doing when we're praying. We're saying, Lord, take care of me. Be my defender. Be the one who strengthens me. Be my provider. Nurture me. Teach me. If need be, prune me. Mature me. That I would grow as your child. And because we need this all-consuming, all-surrounding care, protection and provision. By means of prayer, we come to take refuge in him. And notice this is very important. He doesn't say, 
Preserve me, O God, and make me a refuge. Sometimes we want God to do something for us to make us feel safe. But what David prays is, Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. In you, that actually our refuge and security and peace comes through our relationship with God. Now, God may use external things, providing finance when we are short of finance, providing healing when we're sick. But ultimately, our security flows out of our relationship with him. That is why to have true security, you need to be in relationship with God through Jesus Christ. You need to have turned from your sins and put your trust in him. You need to believe that Jesus died on the cross for you and that you come to him by faith in his work alone, receiving his great, his unmerited favour to cover your sins and the father adopts you as his child. That is the heart of refuge. That's the joy of prayer. The child of God can come in the name of Christ. But David goes on from this opening prayer to then testify to how he takes refuge. If you notice in the psalm, you go through it quickly, the repetition of the word I, me, my. He is testifying to what it means to take refuge in the Lord. And the first thing we see is to take refuge is to depend upon the Lord. If we're asking as in verse one, preserve me, O God. Are we saying, Lord, in you I take refuge? Then we are confessing our need of him. When we are self-sufficient, we depend on ourselves. But, he, but at all times, the believer is called to be dependent on the Lord, not independent or self-dependent. If we're self-dependent and the things we depend on fail us, then we are at a loss as to what to do and our peace goes. If we are God-dependent, then even if the things that God uses normally to meet our needs and to provide for our circumstances, even if they go, we still remain dependent on the Lord. And we still remain in that refuge in him in the storm. So David encourages us to be dependent. And by being dependent, we need to see who God is. So in verse one, he says, preserve me, O God. Using that, the word for God, which refers to his strength. He is strong. And we are weak. Even our greatest strength is still weakness. It says in verse two, I say to the Lord, I say to Yahweh, the covenant keeping God, the eternal, unchanging, faithful God, the great I am. And we see as we see him as the covenant keeping God, the unchanging God, we know that he can be trusted. Then he says, you are my Lord, or Adonai is the Hebrew word here. This is a word for God which expresses his authority. So here David is saying, I submit to you. I am your servant. I am trusting you to have your way in me and in my circumstances. And then in the last part of verse two, he says, I have no good apart from you. So he's submitting, you are my Lord. And then he's saying, you are sufficient. I am satisfied in you. There is no good thing that I can receive or enjoy or have outside of you. 
You are the source of everything. You are enough. You are the only source of good. You are goodness itself. You are the one who brings delight to my soul. And therefore, even if there are other things I may feel I want or need, I feel I lack, I run to you. I submit to you to have your way in my life. And I'm satisfied in you. I'm not self-reliant, self-confident or self-satisfied, but I'm depending on you as a source of everything. So part of taking refuge is to depend on the Lord. Secondly, to be devoted to his people and to him. Now, wait a minute, did you just say being dependent on the Lord apart from you, I have no good? Yes, I have just said that, and that's what the text says. But the very next verse says, as for the saints in the land, as for God's people, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. You know, the great, wonderful thing about the the way the Lord works is he, he doesn't just deal with us as individuals. He saves us through personal faith that he grants us by his grace alone. He doesn't leave us through this journey of life and fighting the storm. He doesn't leave us alone. We have the saints. We have God's people, fellow believers. We therefore are committed to them. Because they are our fellow travellers and our support on the road, on the way of the righteous. Notice it says they are the excellent ones. The excellent ones are not the government officials, the elected officials even. They're not the stars of social media or film stars. Or music, the excellent ones in the sight of God Almighty and should be in the sight of us, his people. The excellent ones are God's people. So Psalm 15 and verse 4 speaks of the, the godly person, the person on the way of the righteous, who honours those who fear the Lord. And if you go towards the end of the Bible in uh, 1 John, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 14, it says, we know we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers, the brothers and sisters. We love the people of God. Do you love the people of God. It's very hard to take refuge in the Lord when we are on our own. And we are we, we may pray, but we're independent of other believers. We may even go to church, but we never really have fellowship. Now I know this is hard in these days, but it's so important. Fellowship, encouragement, both giving and receiving is so important. And if we see God's people as the excellent ones, God's excellent ones, yes, even the weakest saint, then we will be keen to give encouragement, keen to receive encouragement, urgent to pray for one another. And by means of that fellowship and encouragement and upbuilding one another, we do each other good and we help each other to take refuge in the Lord. But taking refuge in the Lord is also being devoted to him by rejecting other comfort and security. In particular, in this psalm, other gods. Verse 4. The sorrows of those who run after another god shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on 
my lips. David speaking of the foolishness of seeking satisfaction and security by running after other gods. Running after is pursuing. It could also have the idea of exchange. So, for example, in, in Psalm 14.1, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And yet, if you go on to Romans 1.23, we see this, or Romans 1.22 and then 23. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. We need to be careful of what we exchange. There is no substitute for taking refuge in the Lord. These other things cannot help us. It says the sorrows will multiply. That was the word that God used of Eve in the Garden of Eden. Your sorrow in childbirth shall multiply. There is no comfort, even in the things that God gives us. There's no ultimate comfort in them. Finances are useful. Food is essential. But there's no ultimate comfort in it. Health is good and is a gift from the Lord. But there's no security in health. Fame and importance, being loved by the world. There's no security or ultimate satisfaction in, in these. So David says to follow them, to worship them, to even take their names on my lips. There's nothing, there's nothing in it. I don't want anything to do with that, he's saying. And it's a good challenge to us. As we, we can put our hopes in a, in a vaccine. And the vaccine is, is a good thing. But it's not the ultimate thing. The only place to take our refuge is the Lord. And yes, last week we spoke about walking on the way and being discerning with our friendships. And again, it, 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 well, that's not saying we shouldn't have non-Christian friends. We must because we're lights to shine in the darkness, to show other people the way. And we can be blessed by friendships with those who do not know Jesus. But again, our ultimate security and worth should not come from these. Indeed, to not take the name of false gods on our lips shows that we should be uncomfortable with the world. James Montgomery Boyce asked this question. Do you find it uncomfortable to be with those who sin openly? Are you troubled by their values, shocked by their desires, repulsed by their blasphemies? Or are you at ease among them? If, like Peter, you have no difficulty warming your hand at the fire of those who deny your master, it is because you are far from him. You best get back to him before you deny him as Peter did. It's a serious admonition, a serious warning that we don't find our security, satisfaction, delight, comfort from the world around. Because if we do, we lose that sense of his refuge. Let's pursue him. So we're called to depend on him, delight in him, sorry, be devoted to him and his people and next delight in him. These obviously all overlap. But in verse five, in contrast to verse four, he says, the Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. David is not going to find his satisfaction and security by submitting to other gods. This was a temptation when he was on the run from Saul. Indeed, he said in 1 Samuel 26 and verse 19, they have driven me out this day that I should have no share in the heritage of the Lord, saying, go serve other gods. At this point in his life, David had no security in the land of Israel, but the Lord was his security. And in this verse, he speaks of God's 
providence, God's care over all the details of life. You are my chosen portion and my cup. That's to do with our daily needs of a portion of food and something to drink. Matthew 6, 11, give us this day our daily bread. Then it says, you hold my lot. We speak in English of our lot in life, the things that form our circumstances. And that's what David is referring to here. And this is in the hands of the Lord. Our circumstances, our lot in life are in the hands of the Lord, not dependent on random events or our own abilities or even the devil's plans. But they're in the Lord's hands. The Lord is also in charge of where he lives. Verse six, the lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Lines has to do with boundary lines, boundary lines in the land where each family was given an a, a allocation of land, an allotment of land when they entered the promised land. There, and he's saying, this is a good place, a good place that you have given me. All that we have, our food, our drink, our circumstances, where we live, they all come from him. He is the one who cares for all of our lives. On this Sunday last year, in the first online sermon, I quoted from the Heidelberg Catechism. Question one says, what is your only comfort in life and in death? And the answer, that I with body and soul, both in life and in death, am not my own, but belong to my faithful saviour, Jesus Christ, who is with his precious blood has fully satisfied for all my sins and redeemed me from all the power of the devil and so preserves me that without the will of my father in heaven, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him. This is our assurance at all times. It's not been easy and it's not necessarily going to be easy, but we can assure ourselves, speak to ourselves that he belongs, that, 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 sorry, that we belong to him and that he orders all things. And as we do that, we find our heart and minds have peace because we've taken refuge in him. But in these two verse, verses, it's not just his providence, but also his person. At the end of verse six. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. In Numbers chapter 18 and verse 20, Numbers 18 and verse 20, we read about Aaron and the priests and God says to them, I am your portion and your inheritance among the people of Israel. I am your portion. And David is saying the Lord is my inheritance. You are sufficient. I am satisfied in you. I'm resting in your providence, in your care of all circumstances. But I also delight in your person and I rest in your presence. And that is how we take refuge in him. Be delighted in the person of the Lord. So depend on him. Be devoted to him, delight in him, and then fourthly, be disciplined to be taught by him. So moving on, verse seven says, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. He teaches me about himself 
in his word. He speaks to us. David says, I will bless the Lord because God is not silent. He speaks to me. He's not left me in the dark. He's not left you or I in the dark. He speaks to us through his word. We don't take refuge in the law because of a hope so, but the absolute certainties of his word. We take refuge by standing on his word, but by also applying the word. So the, the second half of verse seven says, in the night also my heart instructs me. My heart warns, rebukes or disciplines me as I reflect within myself upon the word of God. It's interesting that the, the word that the ESV translates heart is the word kidneys. Now what kidneys do in a human body is that they, they, they cleanse the blood and take out all the poisons, all the toxins from the blood. And actually, as we meditate upon the word of God, that is the effect upon our lives. We see our sin. We're, we're stirred up to repent of our sin. We see our doubts and we're stirred up to trust God. So the poisons and toxins of unbelief and sin go down and our trust and assurance in him grows. So that we're able to say with David in verse eight, I have set the Lord always before me so whatever I'm facing I'm fixing my eyes on him I'm looking at him I'm seeing how great he is I'm looking at his promises I'm standing on his word he is before me not the mountain of my problems but him the Lord and of course the Lord Jesus in Hebrews 12 verse 2 for the joy set before him endured the cross scorning its shame he did that and he is our model indeed again he is this psalm just like we saw last time in Psalm 15 and we follow in his steps we keep our eyes on him his greatness his majesty his promises and we receive the word to ourselves and meditate upon it. And we discipline ourselves through the truth of God's word. And we grow in godliness. And we grow in strength. It says, he is at my right hand. That's the middle of verse 8. He's the one who pours the strength. That's what the right hand symbolizes. The strength into me. So as we look to him by faith. We draw strength from him. So depending, devoted, delighted, disciplined. And finally, destiny. Look to your destiny. The root of that, the security of that destiny is the Lord right now. Eternal hope is not. I hope something will happen in the future that I might go to heaven. Eternal hope is an absolute assurance because we know who God is right now through his word, by his spirit. So he says, verse eight, last part, I shall not be shaken. And his delight is in the Lord. Verse nine, therefore, my heart is glad. My whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. So in reflecting, in praising, that word for I'm glad means spontaneous praise, but based upon something that God has done. So as we look at the cross, we look at his creation, we look at his providence in our lives, we look at his beauty and his holiness, his greatness, his majesty, his love, his kindness, his, the fact he's faithful and covenant keeping and unchanging, we begin to rejoice. And as we praise him, we find ourselves taking refuge in him. But there's more. It's not just a refuge now, it's a refuge for all eternity. It says my flesh also dwells secure. And this is a wonderful encouragement that 
Our bodies are safe in his hands as long as we need them. When we don't need them anymore, they will die. But as Jesus says that he is the resurrection and the life and even though someone dies, yet he shall live. Those who believe in him. We've seen some terrible things in these recent days. With COVID-19, we've lost loved ones. But all hope those who believe are with him forever. Their body on earth is no longer needed. But they have a flesh that dwells secure. Or even though it decays in the grave, their flesh dwells secure. Why? Because the day is coming when the resurrection will happen. Indeed, if you go on to verse 10, you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. This verse is quoted by, by Peter in Acts 2, 25 to 28, and Paul in Acts 13, 35. These are the, 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 these are the, this is a promise of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As Peter himself said in Acts 2, David died and his body was corrupted. But David was looking forward to his son, the greater son, the one who God promised would be upon the throne forever and ever. And his body did not decay. He rose from the grave and he is the one who rose on behalf of every single person who believed on him. Even David, who looked forward to his coming. And we who are after his first coming and look forward to his second coming. He is coming and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we who are alive will be transformed and we will meet him in the air and we will be forever with the Lord. Resurrection is coming. Resurrection is promised. Two weeks before Easter in the timing of God. Here we are in Psalm 16. And your body, if your body is in the grave or your ashes are scattered, your body, if you are a believer, will be renewed and you will have that body fitted for God's eternal presence forever and ever. And that is how the psalm ends. You make known to me the path of life. You make known to me the path of life. God has directed our steps. He's brought us onto the way of the righteous. Proverbs 40, sorry, Proverbs 4 and verse 18. But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. You're on the path of the righteous, brought from death to life, the way of the righteous by grace alone. And in and you, if you're a Christian, have a future in your presence before your face face to face with you O lord is fullness of joy all sufficient totally satisfying joy and you might have a glimpse of something that satisfies on earth that's why people sin because they think satisfaction will be achieved but it passes even as Christians, we have glimpses of satisfaction in God as we take refuge with him on earth. But in that day, there'll be full and total satisfaction. And wait a minute, at your right hand. So we, we've got to turn around. Verse 8, he is at my right hand. He's strengthening me. He gives me honour. And then we get to verse 11. In eternity, we are placed at his right hand. We who have, even though we've sinned and fallen short, are placed by him at that position of honour with him. Jesus says this incredible thing in Revelation 3.21. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. At the place of honour, it says there are pleasures, there are joys, there are delights. For how long? Forevermore. They will never, ever fade or decline. 
in fact, and this is not the main point of the sermon, but actually as when we go into eternity and we see him face to face, all the sorrows of earth will fade away. And that first second or, or, or part of a second of eternity will wipe out the sorrow of all those years of earth. And although we take refuge in him now, we sometimes seem to fall out of that refuge. But, but on that day, we're all wiped away. And yet our delight and our joy in him will grow. Those pleasures evermore as we delight in him for all eternity. Yes, we live in the storms of life. The lightning is flashing, the thunder is crashing, the wind is blowing. How can I get into the shelter? You pray. You stand on the word of God. And as you stand on the word of God, you see how you can depend on him. Be devoted to him and his people. Delight in him. And as you receive your word, you discipline yourself so your taste and love for sin, which often helps cause us to lose focus on him. Those things go down and our delight in him increases. And we see more clearly our destiny, face to face, of pleasures evermore at his right hand. And on this earth, we can look up to our saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who's walked this road, who went through the grave and who is our refuge through death itself to take us to his eternal pleasures at his right hand, to that fullness of joy before his face forevermore. This is how we take refuge in him our feelings do go up and down and there are days when you seek to do these things to depend and be devoted and to delight and to discipline yourself in the word of God and to focus on your destiny and because we still live as fallen people we still feel the heat of the the burning sun and the the, bl the blowing wind of the storm but yeah, even though you may feel you've lost your sense of refuge today, you can still run to him. You can still cry to him, preserve me, O oh God. Watch over me, water me, weed me, prune me, mature me, protect me, guide me, cause me to grow. For in you I take refuge and help me, O oh Lord, to depend, to be devoted, to be delighted and to heed the discipline of your word and I long for that face to face with you. Father we pray that you would lead us in these things in these days. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you in abundance. Thank you for listening.